In this episode of Influencers, DICE founder and CEO Phil Hutchin, along with Tony Fidel, DICE board member, Nest founder, and inventor of the iPod. Humans need to be around other people. I mean, it's one of the things that make us like human and seeing like an amazing um, performer is one of the things that you remember for the rest of your, your, of your life. There's always unintended consequences in everything. And I, you know, technology is neutral. It's what we choose to do with it and how we regulate it and what we socially accept. I think we got a lot of fish to fry uh, and we are frying ourselves. So I think we need to spend more time on fixing the climate than we need to worry about getting into the metaverse. Hello, everyone, and welcome to Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer, and welcome to our guest, Phil Hutchin, the founder and CEO of DICE, also Tony Fidel, a board member at DICE. Tony, as you may know, former uh, Apple executive, iPod inventor, iPhone co-inventor, also Nest founder, and a principal at Future Shape, which is an investment and advisory firm working with engineers and scientists developing deep, uh, well, foundational deep technology, I should say. Got all that. Okay, we want to talk about Dice, and Phil, why don't you start us off by telling us what Dice is all about and what you guys are doing? Yeah, no problem. And nice to see you, Andy. Um, well, first of all, Andy, have you ever bought a ticket? Yes, I have. And how was that? Not so good, Phil. <laughs> the um, and so I think that every time we kind of ask someone if they bought a ticket, that has ever come back to me and with like this, like, oh my god, it was amazing. It was always like. I bought a ticket, I thought it was one price and it was another price, or I couldn't buy a ticket and it was thousands of dollars or whatever it was, or, you know, I, I'd missed out on the show, whatever it is. And so there's lots of problems around it and, you know, the opaque nature of, of the industry. So DICE is a super simple way to find out um, what shows are going on. Um, two taps and you've bought the ticket, you know, it, it's killed um, scalping. Um, and if you can't turn up to the show, you tap a button and you get a refund. And it's just making all those things traditionally associated with, um, you know, going to a live experience, um, they're gone. And, and now it's, it's just very easy. I have a million more follow-up questions and we'll get to them. Mm -hmm. But Tony, I got to ask you, you joined the board of DICE in September. What made you a believer and why join at a time when the live music industry is still getting back on its feet with COVID? Sure, sure, Andy, as well. It's great to see you. So, so for me, you know, music's in my blood, you know, given my past and I'm from Detroit, right? So I, I when I was in Detroit, exactly, um, you know, Ticketmaster first came out and it, it was like a revolution. I could go walk down to a local store and get a printed ticket. You didn't have to go to the box office. And so that was an incredible innovation for me. But since that part, it, they haven't innovated a lot. It's still like, okay, what can we do to extract more money from the, from the, the fans, really, is what it is. And it hasn't been about more convenience, about more access, making it easy. You know, you, you can say what you want about airline ticketing or other travel ticketing. At least you can exchange tickets, upgrade them, change the dates, everything. You don't have any of those conveniences at all in the ticketing, in the entertainment ticketing world or sports ticketing world. Well, that's what DICE is trying to solve. And because I'm such a music fanatic and have been suffering with these things for years, I met Phil and I didn't just get involved with DICE this year. I've been involved with Phil and DICE, I don't know, five, six years now. So this was like literally when they were like 10, 12, 15 people. So we've been working together with them and just been uh, because of the experience that they really want to bring. Fans first. It's all about the fans. Even the artists, the venues, everyone understands that more fans and especially today when you know bands are not making any money except for merchandise and for event and entertainment events other than that they're not making any money on streaming we see that unless you're the top you know 100 artists they don't make any money so where are they going to make their money and how are they going to make sure the fan has a great experience that's what dice is all about Phil, I got to ask you about uh, the competitive set. I mean, Tony mentioned Ticketmaster. They're still around, StubHub, Eventbrite. What sets you guys apart from those companies? And how are you going to build your brand? Right. So the I think I um, kind of touched on it. Like our only customer is the fans. And that was something that um, we established on, on day one. So everything that we, we build is, is for that um, fan experience. So when we're building things with partners or venues or artists or anything else, we always ask the question, is it good um, for the fan? 
And I think that the second thing is that DICE is just software. So, you know, if you're looking at Live Nation, I mean, they, they do huge productions, they do all these things, you know, Ticketmaster is part of it. We're just like the, the you know, using software to bring fans and artists um, closer together, like helping them, you know, decide which cities they are and, you know, how much um, they should be charging, all these things to make it um, super efficient. And I think that the, the third is that we're, we're able to scale uh, much quicker around the globe. So, I mean, we, we started off in London, but now we're in, you know, the, the US, um, in France, Spain, Italy, uh, India, Australia, moving into Southeast Asia. So it's like, it's it's kind of there's a global network effect that happens as well because you know you you're um, you, you're giving that data to artists to help them plan um, global strategies themselves um, you know so it's just really when, when we're talking about empowering um, artists it's like helping them um, you know control the, the, their cash that so they own the cash they they can they can pay people and do things instead of um, waiting for someone to pay them. How do you mitigate against scalpers? You mentioned that. Can you drill down a little bit more there? Yeah, yeah, cool. So this is, I mean, it's like <laughs> things where in hindsight, it's like so simple, but there's nothing to sell. When you buy a ticket on Dice, there's no ticket. And so there's nothing, there's nothing to screenshot. There's nothing to pass on to somebody else or anything else. Just moments before the show, there's like, a, you know, an animated um, a QR code that goes around, which, you know, is there, but um, it, it's a very elegant, simple solution, but it's a, it's a way that, you know, if you've got nothing to sell, and then it's impossible for, for scalpers to, to put it on any platform because they don't have anything. And how much of the business, Phil, is relying upon the return of live music to pre-pandemic levels? And what is your prediction about when that'll happen? So we have to spend 18 months or, you know, give or take, and like sort of stuck in our homes, been entirely digital. And you're thinking about um, one of the things that I didn't appreciate, you know, at the beginning of DICE and kind of really kicked in sort of just before, before the pandemic is that we saw some data in terms of loneliness between, for um, people aged between 17 and 21. And a third of them expressed that they had <laughs> intense periods of, of, of loneliness. Um, um, uh, even before the pandemic. You put the pandemic on, everyone kind of living digitally. The return to live um, since summer, it's been insane. I mean, uh, every record has been broken at DICE uh, in the last, what, five months. Um, when, we're, when we're looking at the data, like still now, shows are completely um, packed, like the venues are packed, everything else. You, you read in the newspapers that, you know, people have become hesitant about stuff and then you go to live concerts and, and they're absolutely uh, full. And I think it's kind of going back into what I was talking about with learners that humans need to be around other people. I mean, it's one of the things that make us like human and seeing like an amazing um, performer is one of the things that you remember for the rest of your, your, of your life. So you know, live experiences, I think that people are actually appreciating them even more as a result of the pandemic. Yeah, all those all those Bob Seeger concerts, right, Tony? <laughs> Bob Seeger at Pine Knob, Michigan. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, exactly, exactly. <laughs> hey, hey, Tony, you're known for your engineering and design acumen. And, and to my understanding, DICE is set up as part a traditional ticket sales platform and part social media platform where you can follow your friends. How does the company make sure the platforms perform well at both rather than just sort of being mediocre at either one? Well, I think, you know, well, first of all, in fact, I'm not, they do such a great job at design. I'm actually not really a part of the design of the app itself. We're more about the business models and how we go and scale and all those, you know, how we do operations and, and build the teams and stuff like that. So that's what I've been really, really immersed in. But when, I, when we look at that social aspect, we've always been saying, okay, we need to have the right discovery mechanisms and we need to have the right sharing mechanisms. So once you say you want to go to a, a show, you can then also then communicate that to your friends. And so it's very interesting. So when you're like in the app itself and you say you're interested and you bought a ticket, anybody in your network that you're connected with. Um, we'll actually get that, you know, Phil's going to shows all the time. I'm getting Phil's going to this show. Phil's going to that show. I'm like, oh, I want to go with him. You know, he's in London. I would like to go with him more. But those are the kind of really key features that you have in there. And that also combines with the with the social, um, with your uh, preferences for music, because it connects to all these music services. So it understands your catalog, what you like to, to, to listen to, to find those events that you might share with other people. So to me, you know, um, 
we don't have anything, we being the rest of the world, the competition doesn't have anything like this. And it just, it's, it makes it so engaging to go to a show because you know your friends are going to, or you get them to go with you. And that, you know, that's entertainment's all about group experience. And you want to go with your, your tribe and, and, and Phil and team have made it really easy to do so. And, and Tony, what about, you know, privacy concerns and I'm, how, how are you feeling about that in terms of collecting user data and can users decline the collection of data on these, on this, on these platforms? How does that work? Well, look, the data, you know, there is the data for the individual and that's, we don't sell the data. You know, we're not selling ads. We're not, we, we are going directly to the, you know, to the venues and to the artists and they get anonymized data. So they don't know exactly who's going to the show. Uh, you know, they have to know if they're buying merchandise or something like that. But other than that, they don't know who's going to the show. So, but what they want is they want the data to say, how are the shows performing? How are they selling before the, you know, the performance state? So they can change the metrics. Remember, you know, today the, the, um, the scalpers, they get all the lift on the tickets. There's one, one or a couple of ticket prices, tiered ticket prices. Then those scalpers get all the stuff on top of it. That's not the way it should be done. The artist needs to get that. And us as fans, if you want a better seat, you don't, you, I'd much rather pay $1,500 to the band who I appreciate, not $200 for the ticket and then $1,300 to a scalper. And so these kinds of things, I as a fan would love that. And I do not mind that they get an anonymized data to the venue and to the, to the more importantly, to the band. You, do you know that the bands don't get any information today? They, it's amazing to me that they don't get anything. How can you run a business like that today? At least they understand something about their music streaming, a little bit about streaming, a little bit about sales. They get nothing on the thing, the number one thing that they make revenue at that keeps the band alive. And so this is empowering for both, I think, the band as well as for the fans, because they can go in and support those bands that they really love. Bill, it sounds like what Tony's describing when he says, I want to buy a $1,500 ticket to be in the front row to see an in excess tribute band. Okay. Cause I know that's where, that's where he does. That's what he does. Um, so, <laughs> yeah. I'm old. See, I, I know, right? <laughs> I know. So, so there's this company out there called StubHub where I can get that front row seat. Right. But I think that money goes to StubHub and not to the band. I think that's what he's talking about. What does your company do? Does it work with StubHub? Is it disrupting StubHub? Talk to me about that. Yeah, so we're <laughs> well, we're stopping the supply of tickets to StubHub on Dice. So the um, you know if you buy a ticket on Dice, you, you can't sell it on Viagogo, StubHub, or, or any of these other platforms. And um, and the thing is that when, one thing that was a surprise to us at the beginning was that when a show was sold out, only about eighty percent of people are showing up. So the thing is that you know you got people speculating on these tickets and selling something at the high price, but then. <clears throat> they're not actually filling up the venues. So with Dice, what we have is that if someone can't go to the show, they get a refund, they get their money back. Um, someone else picks up the ticket. And what that does increases the venue, um, you know, a turn up uh, for a sold out show to 100%. And you can imagine that 20% times beer, you know, you know, chips, whatever it is, that kind of gets added on. It's like looking at how do you make money and margin better by just giving a better fan experience. And there's one thing that, um, as a quote that I really like, is that ethics change, uh, ethics change laws, laws don't uh, change ethics. And I think that from day one, we always felt that fairness was really important. And that's why more artists are, are using Dice because they know that the tickets are protected, that the fans are getting them at the right price. How many meetings I've been in with um, artist managers really discussing like how to get that price at the point where the majority of their fans can actually go and, and, and attend uh, the show. And then for someone to go out and um, there's not many people who can spend 1500 bucks and, and, and seeing that ticket, like they'll, they'll pick those things up, but it's like making sure that real fans are, um, are there to, to see the experience. And actually the other thing by, uh, with us having this uh, technology within DICE, we've done multiple, multiple add-on dates as a result of the demand because we have the waitlist demand. So the, the, the artist turns up, they sell at the show, and then you've got tens of thousands of people in the wait list, so they keep on doing multiple shows. So again, you know, better intelligence for, um, for artists to, you know, um, 
you know, to, to um, see more fans. Yeah, Phil, I've been giving Tony grief about musical preferences. So I'm going to pitch you a little bit. Like, I don't know if it's Adele <laughs> or Coldplay. You know, I'm doing the UK thing with you. Um, so do you work with the artists or do you work with the venues? So in other words, uh, here in New York City, MSG, Madison Square Garden, are you selling tickets for them or are you selling tickets for Adele? So we do it for both, but the focus um, is largely in, on, on venues because many artists play venues. Um, but we have an artist development team and that's part of the, the idea of you know, the, the, the global network is that DICE has um, you know, venues are all around the, the world and then artists want to play um, those venues and we help them kind of you know, you know, connect them with, um, with those venues via the agents or the bookers or, or whatever else. Um, and then part of that is, uh, so I've got an example. So it was an artist in London called by, um, they started off with us from the very first show, 200 people. And we made the deal with them, like, cool, sell exclusively through Dice, and let's kind of like build up this um, live story. And then from that, you know, you're not allowed to spend any money on social media advertising. You've got to trust them to your audience, but get the story right. Now they can sell 50,000 tickets in London. And it's kind of like taking them at each of those steps all the way through. And at, throughout the whole time, Bicep um, understood their audience. They knew what they wanted, where they wanted to play. Um, they, they had control over you know, um, their, their, their live strategy. And, and this is what we're doing at scale uh, now. Right, and so do you cover all the venues in the world or do you have to, are there some venues that are not a part of your ecosystem yet. Yeah, so we, we, we wish we had, well, we, we have all the best ones, or most of the best ones. So there's uh, some holdouts, but the, as in, you know, there's other um, people who have the ticketing rights for, for, the, for those venues. But we have um, 3,600 venues um, uh, sort of around the world, which is increasing you know, day by day. Um, and we also work largely in major cities. So the, um, you know, in New York, over a million people used Dice last month. Um, and so there's quite a big spread of uh, venues in New York. And, and for that, you know, it's the same in Paris and Barcelona, all these things, because there's lots of events happening there. So the discovery engine is really kicking off. And our thing is that if you want to see a, a show once a month, then let's get you to a show once a week. Um, how do we reduce the friction? For you to actually, you know, get there. So, you know, our competition is like people staying at home watching, you know, Netflix. Is like, okay, well, how do we make it as uh, easy and compelling to to kind of get out and see something? And it works. I don't think anyone's been to a great show and said, "Well, I'm not doing that again." So it's the it's the exact opposite. Tony, while I have you here, I got to ask you a few questions about Apple and the iPhone, Silicon Valley. Oh, God. So you are on the cutting edge in designing the iPhone, but it's been around for a while. What do you think is kind of the next big thing in terms of consumer tech? Um, thoughts on the metaverse? Those are two big questions happening right now. Well, the, the big things on the horizon for consumer electronics, you know, we're, we're hearing more about, you know, augmented reality and these kinds of things. We're hearing about the metaverse, you know, frankly, I think we got a lot of fish to fry uh, and we are frying ourselves. So I think we need to spend more time on fixing the climate than we need to worry about getting into the metaverse. So let's make sure we have an environment we live in before we find another environment that, you know, keeps us in like refrigerated chambers and, you know, so that we can breathe and eat. Um, so that's how I feel about the metaverse, you know, uh, but on consumer electronics, I think, you know, a lot of this stuff, people think that this is going to be the next big thing, like uh, augmented reality. I think it will be for certain very niche verticals, but not necessarily like the consumer thing that you need. Because, you know, we, we saw this before. You've got to need the technology and then you have to understand that the consumers want it. Right. And they want to live in that it live with these things on it. And it's social acceptance, not just you accepting it, but the people around you accepting it. And that I've learned that all the time is. The technology might be right, but is the social timing right? Is there a social acceptance? And are you truly, are you truly uh, de uh, delivering a pain clear killer because there's a clear need? There's a clear pain. The iPhone solved a uh, solved uh, you know or uh, solved a uh, solved a need, right? It was on the go, internet, email, you know, media, these kinds of things. Well, we don't see the need yet for the metaverse, and then to have the metaverse wherever you go on you. You know, like we already tried that with Google Glass. I think it's going to take a little while. 
Yeah, and, and speaking of, of Google, you invented, uh, helped create the iPhone, the iPod Nest, which was bought by Google, and these products are networked now in a huge way. What is your take on both the upside and the downside of this um, massive amount of networking that some people say you know, leads to dystopian possibilities, but also tremendous upside? Well, look, there's always unintended consequences in everything. And I, you know, technology is neutral. It's what we choose to do with it and how we regulate it and what we socially accept. So we have to do things that promote social, you know, social bonding, like what Bill's doing with Dice, right? Not letting the, the ticket bots in there, not letting the scalpers in there, doing all the things necessary. And that's what that's why I love what Phil and Dice is doing, is they're trying to bring all the best things to connect the artists to the fans, right? And getting rid of all of those middlemen who are just stealing uh, along the way. So that's what we wanna do. And I, so I love the network. It can have better shows, m have the artists make more things for, for their fans so that the fans have a better and better experience. And maybe we, through that, we can create even more social, social movement to fix some more of these problems. But it, it's about bringing people together and not about a network of, you know, intermediaries stealing along the way. All right, just one more Wayback Machine question. Okay. Me, okay. And that's, you worked with Steve Jobs. Yeah. Um, Apple built a music business when you were there. What did you learn from, from Steve? And what do you think he'd be thinking about the world today and the technology that we're using? Well, I think for, for me, you know, what it was all about in the music store and the iPod, it was always about what do the customers really want? What is going to give them that social or excuse me, that emotional experience that they crave, you know, that they want and a rational part of that, making it simple and, and all those other things. And that's kind of, you know, that's like dice. So when you see something like this, you're like, wow, I think that if Steve was here today, he would go, we need to get artists more money. I think if he looked at the streaming services out there, I know how much he loved musicians, bands, you know, and wanted to support them. I remember way back when he was looking at buying certain media companies, that kind of stuff, because he really wanted to revolutionize that. And so as far as I'm concerned, if he woke up today and saw the streaming services the way they are today and where the artists are not getting fairly paid, he would fix that. Absolutely. I remember Tony and Phil, when he came by and demoed the iPad at Time Inc. when I worked there and he played music and he played Friend of the Devil, and I said, oh, The Grateful Dead. And he goes, I love The Grateful Dead. And you can see he, he really meant it, right? Yeah, I mean, oh, he yes. Really passionate about that. Um, all right, switching back to Dice a little bit and, and some personal stuff. Phil, you come from a musical background, a music industry background, I should say. But geez, what made you decide to get into ticketing? <laughs> yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't tech before going into the music and not knowing anything about the music industry. So very naive, but uh, very lucky in the music industry that, uh, you know, found um, you know, some, some artists who were, were getting bigger and bigger um, and actually didn't care about ticketing, didn't understand it because you, you, you spend so much time, you know, working with the artists and making a, an amazing album to make an amazing artwork, looking at their live show and didn't think about the ticketing until you know the artists started getting bigger in, in North America. And that was the that was when I was, suddenly it was like, hang on a minute, we did a deal for 40 bucks and now the ticket's 65. Where's this 25 going? Um, it's sold out and it's been sold for hundreds, thousands of dollars, and and all the fans are angry at the artists. Like, why isn't anyone fixing this? And so then I went back into sort of old world, new world together and just analyzed all the ticket companies and tried them all out. Didn't want to, you know, just trying to see if there was a solution. And that was the thing. Well, if no one else is going to fix it, I guess that we have to do it. So, um, and kind of just touching on to you know, the, the, the last question as well. I think that, you know, take a lot of inspiration from, you know, what um, Tony uh, created, um, you know, really thinking about the small things, you know, the experience when someone sees it, small little animations within the, the app, the, the ticket, the, the imagery. You're talking about brand before, like people, People wear dice t-shirts and have the bags and everything else. Like all these things are like uh, things which we, you know, really care about because you know you need to make a you know a, a revolution and all this stuff like pays off because you know uh, eventually because of all these things being put together, um, artists make more money in a, in, a, in the right way. I didn't really ask you about the business model, your P and L. How are you doing? <laughs> How's the company doing? So can you dive into that a little bit quickly? Sure. As I mentioned before, it was the, um, you know, we, 
you know, in the pandemic and then coming out of it was like, it's a shock. I mean, we, we um, went from no one going out to everyone going out. Yeah. And, uh, you know, from zero people in New York, like sort of going out to you know, a million people um, going out. So, you know, we, we have, a, you know, it's over a million in, in New York in the last month, a million in London, half a million in Paris, like all these people sort of um, coming together. How we make money is that we charge the venues or the artists for using Dice as, as um, their partner to, to sell the tickets. So it's, it's like we're very pro privacy. Um, and so the, um, you know, again, just protecting the, the fans from this, but also everyone knows like how we, we make money, we make money from selling the ticket. There's no advertising, nothing else that's, that's, out, that's on there. Um, and in terms of the, you know, the, the volume is like, well, it's, um, <laughs> it's accelerating as, as Tony knows like uh, every week. Uh, right well, now, so. let me be clear. We're, we're writing, we're happily writing checks and we're backing <laughs> these guys. And, and even in the darkest of times, we, we, see, we see the light and we see the growth and we see the fans and they're coming back, right? It's sticky. People love it. They're telling their friends about it. We do very little advertising. I meet a ton of people who go, I go, yeah, I'm in the investor and Dice is like, oh, well, I'm a user. Like there's so many people, if you actually ask people in the regions where we operate, there's a lot of people using it. We just don't sit there and, and market it. And, you know, uh, it, it, it's self-marketed because the fans love it. And so that's why we keep investing because we know this is the future and it already is here today. Word of mouth seems to be working. So are you guys venture back, Bill, IPO in the future, perhaps? Yeah. So yeah, we're venture back and, and, and uh, um, public listing in the future for sure. Yeah. Great. And, and Tony, how did you guys meet? So interestingly enough, um, I had friends in, in, in London and have, you know, and they said, oh, you have to meet Phil. You know, you guys would get along. You love music. He's doing something really cool. And Phil and I just were at a hotel. I think it was the Ham Yard. And we just had a, we had a drink and we just started talking. And we talked all about music. And then we started talking about books. And started sharing titles and just getting into, uh, you know, psychology of like a fan and what does it mean and why do we love shows and, and really just, just hit it off. And it was just there. I was like, okay, that's it. And Dice was tiny. It was just a vision. And so it was really about a team and a, and a mission and, you know, and Phil as a entrepreneur uh, and visionary. And Phil, where do you see the company five years, 10 years from now? I mean, doesn't it have to become part of one of the well, they used to call it fangs. I guess they're mangs now. Um, you know, part of an ecosystem. Everything's got to be part of an ecosystem. Um, or can it be a standalone, do you think? going? Forward? Yeah, I think it'd definitely be a standalone. I think that um, live entertainment, you know, how people look at the, the TAM, the, the, the market right now, I think, it's, I think it's undercooked. I think that it's huge. I think that you've... You know, if you've got 90% of the population of the world liking music, maybe half the population loving music and 30% people love music so much that they pay to go see it. And that's a, a, a massive market. And I think that, you know, what we're seeing is growing this around the world. I mean, like, for example, we're just starting off in India. That market could be as big as the U.S. within 10 years. Right. I yeah. love the Pam thing. You know, that is a truly small set. People who hate music. <laughs> yeah. I hate music, right? You don't have to right. worry about that. That's a pretty small group of people, right? It's pretty funny. It was the same yeah, tamp for the iPod. It was the same tamp for the iPod. Right. Yeah, that's about right. That's about right. Just everybody. Um, everybody. And final couple couple last questions here, Phil. What do you think that you want to be uh, your legacy? Wow. Um, <laughs> I, have to, yeah. I have to think about that one. The uh, I okay, you know what? It's the 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 I, one of the things I love the most, yeah, is the idea that we're in Mumbai and there's a scene happening in Mumbai, and there's this new music that's happening in Mumbai, and through the connections of Dice, that artist goes straight into the US and Asia and through Europe and blows up. And we do that time and time again. That the idea of you know um, bringing um, culture sort of around the world that would be awesome. And Tony, same question over to you. You've got all of these things you've accomplished working here with Dice, and I'm sure you've got some all kinds of other things percolating in your brain. What do you hope to accomplish over uh, the following years? Uh, for me, it's it's really about you know mentoring and and investing my time with the entrepreneurs who are truly changing the world for the better. Whether that's 
environmentally, socially, or for health. Those are the three big things, and and Dice is doing that for the social for for the social experience all around the world. It, it, it's amazing, and that's what I hope Phil is able to fulfill and and bring this mission. And I think he's well along the way to to deliver. Well, it'll be great to watch uh, the company grow as uh, we hope we emerge from COVID and, and live comes back and uh, people get interested in your business. So I want to thank uh, Phil Hutchin, founder and CEO of Dice and Tony Fidel, board member there and entrepreneur and an executive uh, extraordinaire. Thank you guys very much for your time. Thank you so much, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Great to see you. You've been watching Influencers. I'm Andy Serwer. We'll see you next time.